everyone welcome to our Torah portion of our service. Shabbat Shalom. Let's all stand. So I recite the blessing before the Torah reading. Baruch Adonai am vevorach leolam vayed. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Asher bekar banu mikol haamim. Venetan lanu etorato. Baruch Atah Adonai no ten haTorah. Amen. Bless Adonai who is blessed. Blessed is Adonai, who is blessed forever and ever. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who selected us from all the nations and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen, amen. and amen. Please remain standing. I'm only going to read three verses in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it says, Vayedeber Adonai al Moshe lemor, shlach lecha anashim, Veyaturu et eretz kenaan asher ani noten livne Israel ish echad ish echad lamate avotav tish lachu ko nasi vachem vayishlach otam Moshe bemidbar paran al pi Adonai kulam anashim. Rashe b'nei Israel chema. Starting in Numbers 13, verse 1. Let me read the closing blessing first. Mm -hmm. Let me recite the closing blessing before we read the English. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher netan lanu turat himet Vechai olam nata betochenu, Baruch kata Adonai, no ten haTorah. Amen. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe. You have given us the Torah of truth and planted within us everlasting life. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen and amen. Numbers 13, verse 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moshe, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moshe, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. These are the names of the men which Moshe sent to spy out the land. And Moshe called Oshea, the son of Nun, Yehoshua. And Moshe sent them out to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, and whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first stripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehov, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Aiman and Shishai and Talmai and the children of Anach. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Ishkol, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff. 
and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. All right, thank you. Today's portion, Parashat, you hear it, Shalach. Some call it Parashat Shalach Lecha, uh, same portion. The complete portion can be found in the book of Numbers 13.1 through 15.41. Last week's portion, Becha Alocha, we talked about Aharon Aaron. When he was instructed to light the menorah in the temple and how the light was to illuminate certain areas in particular or a certain direction, he was to trim the wicks to allow the light to be cast in one direction or a certain direction, I should say. We talked about the question I asked. You guys remember the question I asked you last week? Anybody remember? Can you, can you keep a secret? All right. Oh, good. So we talked about this idea of can you keep a secret and the secrets we're tasked to keep, and those that we must reveal. And at the end of the portion, we saw Miriam come against Moshe, using her words against him. Lashon hara, evil speech and evil tongue against her brother. Uh, she was struck with leprosy. And that's how the portion ends. So we pick up this story, or the, the next portion within the Torah, we pick up the story in Numbers 13, 1, the spies sent into Canaan, into Canaan. And we've all heard this story, you know, Joshua and, you know, and the whole thing. And um, So I taught in that part last year. I want to teach on a different aspect of this portion. But I definitely want to start here at the beginning. Numbers 13, 1, and the Lord spake unto Moshe, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I gave unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man. I think I accidentally copied King James this week, so instead of the complete Jewish Bible. And every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. Were heads of the children of Israel. Whatever we see in Torah the order of things, it makes a difference. Or the, um, uh, the relative, relativity of certain things that are said and done. So we see the story of Miriam, how she curse, or done curses, but she says some evil things against Moses. She's, leprosy comes upon her. Everybody sees. And then you go right to the story of the spies, which I... Don't have time to talk about, but it actually there's meaning in there. It's not just a random thing that happens. But I want to do today, I want to do something. I don't do a whole lot. I want to talk about what the um, rabbis of Israel had to say about some of this. That's really interesting. This is what, you guys ever heard of Rashi? You've heard me bring up Rashi. People talk about Rashi. Uh, so here's what you have to say. Rashi was a, a, a French um, rabbi in the uh, I don't think I put it here, in like the 12th century, something like that. Um, but here's what he had to say. When it talks about in this first, in, chapter, in verse 2, it says, send thou men. Why is the section dealing with the spies? It's in a um, section that's just dealing with Miriam's death. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of transition. It just goes one thing, and all of a sudden it butts up to another thing. But it's there to show the grievousness of the spy's sin because Miriam was punished on account of the slander which she uttered against her brother. And these men witnessed, it, witnessed this, and yet they did not take a lesson from her. So they go, and I'm not going to get into the evil report that came out of it, but they go right into the land, they come back, slander against God's promise. 
the promise of the promised land. When it says send thee, so the, 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 the title is send thee or send for yourself or send thyself. And it's interesting to note when you're trying to um, translate from Hebrew into English, you just lose some things that are, I mentioned something in the class we were talking about earlier. But this idea of send someone according to your own judgment, the Lord didn't command you. The Lord didn't command them. The Lord didn't command Moshe to send somebody. But if you wish, you can send them. So in this situation, the Lord is like, you know, send someone if you want to. I'm not telling you to, but send somebody. God said this because the Israelites came to Moses and said, and look what they had to say. This is, it's wonderful when you have the same account of a particular story in multiple sections of Scripture. Deuteronomy 122 says, We will send men before us, as it is said, and you approach me, all of you saying, We will send men. And Moses took counsel with the Shekinah, the glory of God, the Lord. Whereupon he said to them, I have told them long ago that the land is good. As it is said in Exodus 3.17, God already said the land was good. What was the need for them to spy anything out that God already said? What's that? Yeah. To test, well, but he, yes. It did, obviously, it tested them, but he didn't tell them to do it. They decided to do it. After he already said it was, the land was good for them. Again, we're just a couple years after they left. We're about two years, I believe, after they left Egypt. But yet, they were days away from being able to go into the promised land, but yet we know about 38 more years. We've talked about the great sins of the Bible the sin of Adam and Eve, the sin of um, uh, Egal Zahab, the golden calf, which is huge, which I'll teach on one day because there's a lot of stuff I've never taught on that's really good uh, that people don't connect to why Messiah did what he did, how he did it. This is another great one, the sin of the spies. These were leaders. These were a, this was a leader taken from all of the tribe. This was a representative of the tribe of Clovis, tribe of Kingsburg, of Sanger, of Fresno, of course, Gold. These are men of men within the congregation of Israel who are supposed to lead the people into what God already said, that he promised it's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's a blessing. Why do we go check it out? See, this is where we get into things even today where we God tells you to do something and tells you something, you got to go check it out first. And we talked about when they got to Mount Sinai, when they came, we mentioned this in class today, they came and they stood there, Moshe comes down, there was smoke, there was fire, there was lightnings, there was thunders, and he brings down the Ten Commandments. And he's been up there 40 days. And they've sinned a great sin. And it wasn't the ladies Women say yay. Yay. Because it wasn't you. It was the men. It was the ones who, the leaders. It wasn't the priests. Other than Aaron. Thank God there's always some people with some sense amongst the group. And as a man, it's sad to say, it's usually the ladies. This is why in Judaism, you know, it's taught that ladies can, us, can get a lot closer to God because they don't deal with the stupid stuff that we deal with that just trip us up when God already said to do it. And we're just, you know, oh, well, we don't, you know. Can you imagine the wives of the spies? What do you mean you go and check out to see if the land is good or not? God said. What do you mean you're going to see if there are, sp- or if there are giants or anything in it? Well, what do you think God raised up an army for a couple portions ago? If you're just nothing? An army to go and what? Just collect some fruit? Yeah, there's going to be some opposition. Yeah. Well, that's usually the case. 
The men were overthinking, the women trusted. Mm, 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 mm. Has much of that changed? <laughs> Hallelujah. What's that? Oh, yeah, the giants were huge. The fruit was huge. The lack of faith on the part of the men, huge. The wives doing this to the men, huge. No, probably not. <laughs> but if it was, it was justified. Amen? Hallelujah. And today, this is where we get today. Can't we just trust him that he's telling us the truth and just act on it? This has been a big thing coming up to our second anniversary. Because what the Lord has started, I ask you, can't we just trust him that he's telling the truth and just act on it? Can't we just show up on Shabbat and keep on, and keep on acting on it? Hallelujah. This is a big secret that is right there, but a lot of people don't see it. And when they see it, they don't want to accept it necessarily. We come to Shabbat. We don't come for some big old to-do with some big expectation of angels. And we know we come. Why do we come? God said to come. He said to come. And Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus, he said, if you love me, what are you going to do? Keep my commandments? You're going to stop on my day of rest and come worship me. There's a story at the end of this portion. It's the, the man who gets stoned for breaking Shabbat. I'll teach on it next year. No, that was, well, no, no, that, yeah. <laughs> Forgive us, that's a California reference. Um, but you know what? It's, it's a really good story, but I don't have time to teach on it too. But how many of you know we live in great grace, in great mercy, oh God, that he loves his people enough to give us instructions on how to live. Hallelujah. So continue what Rashi had to say about this. He said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto a land flowing with milk and honey. But their lives, I swear that I will give them now an opportunity to, to fall into error through the statements of the spies so that they should not come into possession of, of it, of the land. You know, God's going to give you an opportunity to use your mouth and to say things. You get to decide if it's in agreement with what he said or not. You know, we have to look at ourselves, look in the mirror, look at one another, how God sees us. You know, we talk about all the time about looking at each other um, and uh, thinking the best of one another. Um, and... That comes back to believing what God said about people. You know, if we believe what God said about everyone here, how much peace comes with that? Which there is. As we can, let me rephrase that. As we continue to believe the best about one another. You know what it causes us to do? It causes us not to, because you're not looking for some type of, Drama or mess or some type of. Not looking for that. And the minute that kind of stuff shows up and walks through the door, you recognize it. No, this isn't the place for it. This is a place of peace and respect and honor. We're going to honor God by doing the two things, the two, somebody say the two big things that he said to do. Which are what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as your enemy. No. <laughs> love your neighbor as yourself. And all 613 instructions or laws are caught up in the 10, and those 10 are caught up in the 2. Hallelujah. God doesn't force, his, force any of his people to believe and trust he didn't force them to, you know, it would have been a lot easier sometimes when we look back and say, I wish he would have forced Adam and Eve or stopped them from sinning, would have forced them from not building the golden calf, would have forced them 
the spies to give a good report. And you can keep on going on and on, but he didn't. He doesn't force us today. Grace has always existed. Mercy has always existed. Amen? We need to constantly remind ourselves of what he's already said. We need to remind ourselves of what he's already done. And, somebody say, and. and. Continue to work in partnership with him doing what he's called us to do individually. Each week as I'm preparing the, the little drash on the Torah or the message or any type of teaching, when I feel stress come upon me, this week here, having to back everything up, and we were in Southern California until Wednesday night, Sunday to Wednesday night. You know, I felt like, man, I got all this stuff to do, and I've got less time. And in a regular week, it's a lot to do. And I can feel that stress come on. And I keep reminding myself, and Stacy does all the time. She's real good about reminding me of this. You know, God hasn't let you down yet. Have you ever just showed up with nothing to teach on, nothing to say? And when she tells me that, or I think about it, I just go, so today, as I finished up, I tell you, I'd done an hour, I was done. I had three hours less time of just considering, and, and I was done an hour early. And I just sat there feeling so foolish. Why don't we just trust as we obey? Why not? See, again, my wife doesn't have a problem. She just looks at me and smiles in the kitchen. Oh, honey, it's going to be fine, you know. And I'm like this. But we need one another. Amen? You know, when I come on Shabbat and I leave here, I go home, I feel like, wow, you know, I feel like my gas, my spiritual gas tank has been filled up at $2 a gallon and ready to go. Let me go fight the good fight for another week until Shabbat rolls around again. Amen? He always provides a message and a direction for the week. And when I remind myself of that, of what he's already said and done, I can feel this peace coming on me once again. Whenever you're dealing with any kind of stress, anxiety, pressure, a bad report, someone's calling you, they're sick, someone died, Someone's going to the hospital, they're in the hospital. Always remember, Lord, you've already done so much, I'm not going to. And people unknowingly will try and put it on you. That no, you should feel, I was talking to somebody who may hear this and tell them about a situation we're dealing with. And they said, you know, I don't mean to say it like this, but you know, I'm not saying you sound kind of crass about it, but... Well, I mean, if I were just to go down into... One thing going on. And your whole life can't be excited and woo-hoo because of something going on. The best place to stay is like this. And when people see you and they see you, if you go really high, guess what else you're going to do? You're going to go really low. And you're going to be like a yo-yo. And we get calls all the time. I mean, I, I like picking up my phone. There's a bad report coming from somebody. Somebody has a need of something. Somebody's sick. You know, if I did like this, I, you know, I'd have less hair than I have now. <laughs> but seriously, you can't, you have to just trust God. Live week to week. I'm in. So I'm not stressed. I'm not acting on stress. The children of Israel heard the good report from God and they got stressed. And they acted on it. Hallelujah. They went to check to see if, if, in fact, what God said was true. If, in fact, God had told the truth. If, in fact, did they hear him right? 
when they could have just walked in his peace and saved a whole lot of drama for everyone. We walk in his promises because he said so, whether we feel them or not. Amen? Sadly, the children of Israel, the men got short-sighted. And not just any of the men, it was the leaders got short-sighted. We can't duplicate their mistake. We must learn from them and not fall into the same trap. Amen? Because I guarantee everyone who's listening right now that Hashem is dealing with you on the Shabbat, and you have a thought right now that you're thinking about. What are you telling me, God, in this? If you're alive, you've got, you've got to deal with these things every day. It's a good thing to take this guidance. It's a good thing to learn from others' mistakes, in particular in Scripture, because they're the ones who God said, look, look to, see what they're doing, see what they're doing right, see what they're doing wrong. The children of Israel were given many instructions, but he didn't tell them exactly how to execute some of the instructions. And this is what I want to talk to you today, another section of this portion. Remember God told Noah to build the ark? He gave him some specific instructions, how long it would be, how tall it would be. But it was Noah who built the ark using the guidance, the guidelines given to him by God. It wasn't God. And if you read the instructions that he was given, I mean, it was very minimal. In a time where a boat had never been built. What's, a, what's an ark? What do you mean there's going to be animals who are going to come to voluntarily? Because remember at the time what was going on, sin had rose so much, even the animals... You know, the animals in the garden, they weren't evil going around eating each other. The animals had gotten wickeder and wickeder and wicker, so they're going to come in. And the animals were bigger. Man was bigger then. The people say, well, how did Noah, you know, he couldn't have got all those animals on the ark. You know, that's just a bunch of hooey. Well, a couple ways we know in the natural he could have. The whole purpose for him getting the animals on the ark in the first place was for what? So replenish the earth. So guess what he brought on the ark? Young animals. In some cases, maybe babies or ones who were just weaned, who didn't need to rely on mom and dad or mom anymore. And they were ready to come, and so they took up less space. Babies sleep a lot. They eat less. The remains of their eating are less. All of those kind of things. Noah didn't, he wasn't told exactly what to do, how to build this pen. He, none of that. He acted, what did he act on? On the instructions he was, he was given, and then he just did as he saw fit, and Adonai didn't come and stop it. This is how we need to act. What did God tell you to do? Don't sit around waiting for every little detail to come and no, go on and act to the best of your ability, what he's telling you to do. And if he wants you to stop, he will. If he wants to redirect, he'll turn your steering wheel a little bit. He may come in and pump your brakes a little bit. But he says, act. Amen? God didn't come down and build the ark. He just acted on what he was instructed to do, Noah. And he did to the best of his ability. This understanding of the partnership between God and and man and his people is everywhere. And I try and just show you when I can. It can be seen throughout the Torah, even the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, where the Jerusalem Council gave further halakha or instructions in light of Messiah to the people. The rabbis of Israel were given an oversight and decision-making abilities by God that hasn't ended even today. Amen? This is really important to understand this, um, or you run, you run aground with some things. Now, with that understanding in mind, let's read... Continue, this is towards the end of this portion, Numbers 15, 37. And it says, Adonai said to Moshe, speak to the people of Israel, instructing them to make through all their generations zitziot on the corners of their garments and to put with the zitzit on each corner a blue thread. 
It is to be a tzitzit for you to look at and thereby remember all of Adonai's mitzvot or his commands and obey them so that you won't go around wherever your own heart and eyes lead you to prostitute yourselves. Pretty strong words. Your King James is going to say something a little different. But it will help you remember and obey all my mitzvot and be holy for your God. I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt in order to be your God. I am Adonai, your God. Amen and amen. So we just said the blessing over donning the, the talit. And we did the basic version. There's more to it than that. But all of that, even wearing the, tal, the talit with the, the, the zitzi, are based on this scripture right here. Does any of it say very specific instructions of how they, I mean, how did they get from what's said here to here? How did they do it? And will you go around different congregations wear different ones, but they all have a few things in common. What do they have in common? They're all seed seed. How, how so? We we'll talk about this, but I want to read you what Rashi had to say about this as well, and we'll talk about this. This is why we did what we did earlier, um, and this is why I want to concentrate on this one here. Um, I did mention earlier, Rashi, his name is Shlomo it's, uh, Itzhaki. Um, he was a French rabbi who lived in from 1040 to 1105 in France. Um, he was a uh, an author, and he wrote a comprehensive commentary in the Talmud and the commentary in the Hebrew Bible or the Tanakh. So this is where this comes from. His commentary is what he wrote about the Torah, and in, uh, in this case, this particular scripture. He talks, okay, when it says, speak to the, the Israelite people, B'nai Israel, and instruct them to make for themselves fringes on the corners of their garments throughout the ages. Let them attach a cord of blue, the fringe, uh, let them attach a cord of blue to the fringe at every corner. That shall be your fringe. Look at it. See, there's a reason why. Thank you. There's a reason why we even wear these or have them. It's not some tradition. Oh, because they did it. It was a tradition that's been going on for a lot of years, so we just do it for the sake of. It's not. There's a reason why. Anybody ever go to a church? And there's some churches have a tradition of everyone holds up their Bible and they say, this is my Bible. It is. I am everything it says it is. Today I will learn from the word of God. You've heard that? You, yeah, I know you have. Yeah. Well, does that mean that it's just a tradition and you never read the Bible? It means nothing. We're just doing it for the sake of doing it. No, there's a reason why. So when you go home, you say, this is my Bible. Oh, really? I am what it says I am? I'm a child of God because of Messiah? Oh, wonderful. Hallelujah. Thus you shall be reminded to observe all my commandments and to be holy to your God. I am your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am your God. And it goes on to say, it talks about the fringes. And again, the, the fringes, a zitzit. And why is it even named that? See, there's whys too, not just hows. Because the threads that hang down it is similar to the word found in Ezekiel 8.3. You can look this up at your leisure. And it says, and he caught me by the curls of my head. So the word, word for curls is the word zitzit. Z, uh, it's a different emphasis. Zitzit, as opposed to zitzit. The word denotes something twisted as threads or curls. Another explanation is called, oh, it's called a zitzit because of the common or the command associated with it in verse 39. And you shall look at it. The word for looking, which you can find in the book, or look at looking, of Ashir Hashirim, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 9, is the word 
mezitz. And it says in there, uh, 2.9 says, oh yeah, looking from the lattice. The word therefore denotes something looked at. So they don't just hang here. They're there for reason to look at, to cause you to remember what God has said to do. Amen? And you shall remember all the commandments of the Lord. How so? How are you going to remember all the commandments of the Lord by looking at the zitzi? Anybody? The zitzi will remind one of all the commandments because the numerical value of the letters of the word zitzi is 600. Remember we talked about the numerical values earlier in the books. The numerical value is 600, and there are eight threads, as you can see there, and there are five knots. 600, five, and eight is what? 613, which is the number of the commandments of the Torah. Contrary to popular belief, this has gotten out there, and it's that there's 10 commandments and the rest of them were a bunch of things that the rabbi said to do. And we don't have to do it. No, there are 613 commandments in Torah given by God through his people. Um, the rabbi said, or the, and the rabbis commented about, hey, how, sh how can we do this? This is why I bring up in the congregation, I say things like, how can we do this? Because it's always about we serving God together. Amen? The verb has the same meaning in Numbers chapter 13, 25, concerning the spies. And they returned from searching. The word is mitor. They returned from searching the land. The translation is there, therefore is, and you shall not search after your own heart. The heart and the eyes are the spies of the body. They act as its agents for sinning. The eyes see, the heart covets, and the body commits the sin. All this stuff is connected. It's not just random. Hallelujah. Verse 1541, I am the Lord your God. Why does he state this twice in that verse? This is the last verse in that portion. He states it twice. And what the rabbis had to say is in order that the Israelites would not say, why has God said it? It is not already in order, isn't it already in order that we should perform the commandments and receive the reward for doing so? We will not perform them as we shall not receive. We shall not expect any reward. Therefore, it states again in general terms and without reference to Exodus from the Exodus from Egypt, I will be the Lord your God. In spite of yourselves, I will be your king. I will exercise my Yeah, I will exercise my sovereignty upon you. What's he talking about? He already knew. Before he even gave them the command, he knew they were going to break it. He wasn't going to break it. You know, we have, if you've had children or you've, we've all have been children, I remember growing up and either a teacher or somebody would tell me something and and you kind of say, yes, 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 knowing full well you weren't going to do it, whatever it was. You know, he's never done any of that. Or your parents tell you to do something. You say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do it. You know, your parents say, hey, be home by 10 o'clock. Oh, yeah, yes, 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 yes. And you're out with your friends, and, you know, you see 10 o'clock, and I'm not going home right now. When your parents tell you that, you know why they're telling you that? Because they love you, yeah. Because they figure, for one, that you need to be told. But most likely, they know you're going to break it. And then once you break it, maybe they tell you again, okay, look, don't let it happen again. But their parents know inside, they're going to break it. And then you really lay the hammer down. Look, you're going to be grounded. They're going to break it. This is how God saw it. He knew well before they did it, they were going to break it. 
in a similar sense, it states in Ezekiel 20, 23, surely with a strong hand I will reign over you. Hallelujah. Another explanation, why is the exodus from Egypt mentioned in connection with the fringes? In order to intimate, it was I who distinguished in Egypt between one who has, was a firstborn and one who was not. I shall also find out the exact punishment from him who attaches the indigo dyed, dyed wool, which resembles the techelet in color on the garment. On his garment and pretends that it is to hell. The Lord is going to find out whether someone is real or not, or just faking something. He knows the real deal that someone is trying to fake. He, know, you know, he knows your heart. You may as well just tell him, not lie to him. He's not gonna. You're not gonna tell him something that's going to surprise him. He already knows. Hallelujah. And then later on, it says the it talks about the wings of their garments. It's an allusion to God having delivered them from Egypt, as it states in Exodus 19.4, and I bore you on eagles' wings. And the edges of the talit is referred to as, the, as its wings. The tzitzit are to be placed on a garment having four corners, but not on one that has three or one that has five. Well, who said that? Did God say that? No. Then why'd they do it? Because they were given authority to decide that. This is, this is really big to understand this. That God actually gave man authority, yet at the same time he was sovereign. But he expects you to do something at the same time he doesn't necessarily need you. He can do it himself. He knows you're going to make a mistake and rather than stopping you, he allows you to do it anyway and still loves you and still wants to use you. I mean, what a God we serve. You talk about grace and a lot of mercy and a lot of patience all the way from the beginning. Hallelujah. Again, the zitzit are to be placed on a garment having four corners. See the two corners there? Two corners here. Not one that has three or one that has five. Thereby alluding to the four different terms used by God in describing the deliverance from Egypt as it states in Exodus 6, 6 through 7. And I will bring forth, and I shall deliver, and I shall redeem, and I shall take out. A thread of purple is an allusion to the bereavement which the Egyptians suffered through the death of their firstborn. Also, the plague that befell them was when? At high noon? No. It's at night. And so, too, the color techelet resembles the sky when it darkens. The eight threads in it are an allusion to the eight days that Israel waited from the time they went forth from Egypt until they sang the song of praise at the Red Sea. Remember, God gave Israel an irrevocable assignment. Scripture tells us that... Um, the, um, the calls, uh, Romans, uh, in the, the whole grand scheme of things. Hallelujah. God gave Israel an irrevocable assignment, which included many things that they were given authority over, how to do it, how to implement. You heard me use the word halakha. What is that? It's the laws or it's the instruction. Well, how do we do this together? Well, I think we do this. I think we do that. Okay, we're, as a congregation... 
we're going to do this together. We're going to go here, and we're going to walk out together. That's like the halakha of Emek Elohim, of how we exit together. And they agreed about a lot of things. And God sat there and looked. He's fine with it. Yeshua comes around, and he's walking through a crowd. And the King James says, on one hand, it said that he had a, a garment that was made of, it didn't, it didn't, uh, it was made of basically of one string. But the other part of it says that the lady touched the hem of his garment. Well, you don't hem something that is, if it's made of one piece, well, you don't hem it. Didn't say, and why does it say that? He didn't say that. It says in Hebrew that she, and even says in Greek, that she came and she grabbed the zit seed of his talit. Someone said, oh, yeah, but you know, you see the pictures, and the lady's all the way down, like laid out, and she's grabbing him, like by his ankle. Well, you know, I can pull out my talit gadol, and the thing is huge. I mean, as a matter of fact, when I wear it, it's actually touching the ground. If I, I don't want to, that's one of the reasons I don't wear it a whole lot, or I haven't worn it much. Touching the zit seat of his talit. Yeshua came around and saw what the rabbis had decided thousands of years ago, and he was fine with it, and he put his, his talit on with his zit seat on it, along with the disciples, along with the whole house of Israel. Nobody was rejecting that or coming against that. Not even all the different sects of Judaism. Nobody was. The only ones who come up or come against that are Gentiles who don't know any better because they have no understanding of is or of uh, the history of Israel. Hallelujah. So we can't, we cannot, and will never. I can rephrase that. The gifts and calls upon Israel cannot and will never be taken away from them. Why? Because God promised it. God doesn't break His promises. When anybody ever says something against Israel, say, yeah, but God promised them. Yeah, but look at how they're behaving. Yeah, but God promised them. It doesn't matter how they're behaving. That's it. You may not like it, but that's the reality of it. God promised it. He said it. He doesn't break his promises regardless of what the children of Israel do. So in closing, this is the idea... I bring up as a congregation when I say, how can we do this? How can we do it together? And this is the reason why. Because this is how the house of Israel come together. Remember, they came together because they had the disciples, and they said, what do we do with these guys? We, we beat says something, men of Israel, and they just stopped, and they listened, and he said something, that was it, and they all agreed, here's how we do it together, and that's what they did, that's how it works, one day we'll see the children of Israel walking in the fullness of the commands of God, and until then, we continue to follow Messianic Jewish rabbis who are already doing so, this is the great commission and the great command of the Messianics today. And it's the great command of the church, but they don't know it yet. And for whatever reason, God hasn't revealed this to everyone in the church because you tell people this and they don't get it. They think you're crazy. And I just said, that's okay. I'm, just, you know, I'm okay with it because God hasn't revealed it to you, so that's wonderful. That, then it leaves me, I don't have to, I'm not trying to push something on you that God hasn't shown you. But there's coming a day. Scripture, we see it in Scripture when it says that 10 men from the nation shall go and grab the hem of a Jew and say, hey, we're coming with you. We know God's with you. That Scripture says that. Right now, we're a whole lot closer to that than when it was uttered by the prophet. Amen. So, Father, we thank you and praise you for this time we've had together 
talking about your word, talking about your Torah. And we ask, O oh God, that we would continue to do our best, to do the best we can do, O oh God, to continue to stay in fellowship with you, to continue to stay in fellowship with one another, and continue to move forward, O oh God, no matter how many mistakes we make, no matter how tough it is, O oh God. No matter what's going on, Lord, we make a choice to continue to live from Shabbat to Shabbat, worshiping you, praising you, rejoicing in you, thanking you, keeping the commands that you've called us to keep, O oh God, and keeping our ears open to bring anybody in who wants to come in and be a part. So we thank you and praise you for all of this. In the mighty name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, amen and amen. And before you shut us off, anybody have any questions or comments? Take us, anybody? Is that your hand going up? Oh, okay.